I don't think you should be able to say about someone, he is a point guard, he is a power forward. You have to be a basketball player. There are guards who are good rebounders and big guys who can make good passes. So, you know, the labels do not always fit. You are locked on fantasy basketball. Your daily podcast on fantasy basketball. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. And today's Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast is also brought to you by Blue Apron. Go to blueapron.com slash L-O-F-B to get yourself three free meals. My name is Josh Lloyd and as always you can find me on Twitter at RedRock underscore B-Ball, on Instagram at RedRock underscore B-Ball and on Facebook at facebook.com slash Red Rock Basketball. We are here to do another of the season in review shows. We're going to be talking about the uh, very exciting Milwaukee Bucks. So let's get to it. To it. Let's get to it indeed. Um, just uh, recording this, I'm sure you can you can tell, we're recording this a day after game two of the NBA Finals in which the Warriors again smacked the Cavs. And uh, I picked Warriors in five. It looks like I may have been a little bit too generous and it looks like we might be seeing the uh, Warriors get that sweep. But we go back to Cleveland now and see how see how that goes. And maybe I think the Cavs can probably sneak one there in Cleveland, but the Warriors have just looked uh, just looked ridiculously impressive in those first two games. But there is a long way to go, so we'll uh, we'll withhold total judgment. But uh, so far, it is playing out the way that I anticipated it, and I'm sure that's not what uh, what most people would have uh, would have liked to see when this final series started. Um. Let's talk Milwaukee Bucks. They were 42 and 40 this season. Um, overperformed their point differential by two wins. So I guess sort of spot on where they needed to be with their with their wins. Um, you know, nothing too outlandish, nothing too, you know, no bad luck going against them. So you know, right on where they needed to be. And that's uh, with some pretty serious injuries. Obviously the Chris Middleton injury, which kept him out for the first four months of the season. And then the Jabari Parker ACL, which kept him out for the last three months of the season. So it's two significant injuries to you know, two of their three best players. And they're still able to get that sort of a that sort of a record is a fantastic result. Now, I'm very critical of Jason Kidd. You've heard me say that before, but I do give him credit for being able to get the team to the sixth seed, you know, push the Raptors as far as they did, and, and be that successful. I still think that he holds them back with dumb, dumb decisions continually, and that they could be a lot better than what they actually are if they had a coach who didn't make those poor rotational choices. But I do give him credit for being able to, to, to um, you know, push forward through those injury crises and you put together a fun, competitive, challenging young team. So you know, kudos to Kid for that. The Bucks picks in the upcoming draft picks 17 and 48. I would guess they'd be looking for um, a, a big man. Yeah, someone with Parker injured, with um, Henson terrible, with Munro perhaps leaving. You know, the the need for someone in that front court I think is pretty stark. And whether that's a, a guy, maybe a Jarrett Allen, I'm not sure they'd go that way after picking Thon McCurr though. Um, do they look at John Collins if he falls down that far? There are a few guys, Justin Patton maybe. Do they take a Justin Jackson? Um, not uh, North Carolina Justin Jackson. Do they take him if he falls down there as a as a wing player as well? I think that could be a decent way for them to go. I also think yeah, getting a shooting guard would be a good option if they happen to find someone like, say, a, a Donovan Mitchell. I don't mind a Cinderius Thornwell there for them as well. Yeah, their shooting guard you know, stocks. There is Chris Middleton there, um, but we don't know what's going to happen with Tony Snell and his restricted free agency. So there is still a little bit of unknownness with that area. So they have pick 17. They have pick 48 as well in this upcoming draft. Free agency, as I touched on, it's Greg Munro has an $18 million player option. I'm not sure what he is going to do. At, at some point, it felt like it was inevitable that he would opt out. I hate the way that he was used by Kidd this season. Um, I think he was terribly underplayed, only played 22 minutes a game. Now, can Munro find himself a role and a contract that's big enough to for him to consider opting out? That, that's that's debatable. So I think it's probably 50-50 at this point as, as to whether Munro comes back or not. The other one is Spencer Hawes with a $6 million player option. I would think he returns. He was not good for the majority of last season. 
The other interesting ones they have, obviously, Jason Terry is an unrestricted free agent. Mick Beasley is an unrestricted free agent. And the mitten, Gary Payton the second is also an unrestricted free agent. But the one where the most intrigue lies would be Tone Snell, who is a restricted free agent, who was utter trash for his first three seasons in Chicago and came across to Milwaukee and either made me look like an idiot or the Chicago Bulls look like an idiot by being a serviceable player. Now, he wasn't as good as what some people may have uh, may lead you to believe. He actually was you know, almost a team worst in on-off at negative 5.1. He's not a great fantasy player, but he did exactly what he needed to do for this team. But when they're fully healthy, he will be he won't won't have anywhere near that same role that he had this season. That was sort of smack bang in the middle with their with their offensive and defensive ratings. Thirteenth in offensive, nineteenth in defensive, but twenty sixth in pace. You would have hoped with a team as young as that they could push it a little bit more. Yeah, Yanni, Jabari, Middleton, Snell, these guys are relatively young and athletic and, and should be able to do that, but uh, that wasn't the way that they ran, I guess, injuries and uh, the center position did hamper that. They were seventh in effective field goal percentage, fifth in creating turnovers, and fifth in assists. So that all helped boost that offensive efficiency, offensive rating, and get them to those 42 wins. They also were 21st in... Um, in um, committing turnover so you held on to the ball so when you're fifth in assists and 21st in turnover percentages it goes a long way to providing an, off, uh, an efficient offense the highest offensive rating on this team was Spencer Hawes despite his limited minutes and his general suckiness Yanni second and then Jason Terry Tone Snell and Thon McCurr all came in next while the best defensive rating unsurprisingly went to Ante de Kumpo, second to Greg Munro which I think would surprise a lot of people Johnny Henson next and then Mick Beasley came in fourth they only had four guys shoot over 40% on corner threes, which given the fact that they finished seventh in the league in effective field goal percentage, I think that's somewhat of a surprise. It was Spencer Hawes, Malcolm Brogdon, Jabari Parker, and Chrissy Middleton shooting over those 40% on threes. But the, the key part here is, is Brogdon, Parker, Middleton, three of their core guys were able to do that. Unfortunately, their superstar, Yanni, hit just 20% of his corner threes and obviously that's an area where he has got massive room to improve spencer hawes i said that he had that highest offensive rating that's in large part due to the fact that he was able to shoot 93 percent at the rim not uh, not realistic for him to continue that yanni was 71 percent that is realistic while dally just the uh 40 percent and he was uh he, i guess he was a disaster for the majority of this season maybe not maybe that's being a little bit harsh but definitely wasn't the player that uh, i think milwaukee thought that they were necessarily getting Let's look at the leaders in advanced stats for this team. Yanni led the team in PER unsurprisingly at 26.1 and true shooting went to Hawes at 62 and impressively toned Snell at 60%. Usage was Yanni, win shares was Yanni, win shares per 48 was Yanni, offensive box score plus minus was Yanni, defensive box score plus minus was Yanni, box scores plus minus was Yanni and shockingly VORP was Yanni. With defensive box score plus minus, Terrence Jones actually led the team. He had a defensive box score plus minus in 6.6, .6, but he played six minutes on this team. That was one of the more curious moves in the entire NBA season that doesn't get mentioned much. The fact that Jones, and I am not a big Terrence Jones fan, I don't think he's good. I think he puts up fantasy stats when he plays, but I don't think he's a good player. But he was putting up decent numbers when he got that opportunity in New Orleans, and he wasn't able to stick in that role because he is not good. And then when DeMarcus Cousins arrived, he demanded to be released because he, he wanted to go somewhere where he could start and get minutes and boost his value because he was playing on this one-year minimum, minimum deal. He wanted to go somewhere where he could get yeah, an opportunity with Jabari Parker out in Milwaukee. Yeah, he moved across there and played six minutes because he is bad. So there is lots of curiosity there. The fact that he you know, demanded to be released from New Orleans so he could go find somewhere to play. And either he's he's dumb, his management's dumb, or the Bucks lied. Or, or literally no other team wanted anything to do with him. Because to make a song and dance about, can you release me? You know, do me a favor, cut me to the detriment of your own team, which is the Pelicans, because I want to go somewhere and I want to I want to play minutes and boost my value and get back into you know, a decent contract. And the Pelicans said, you know what, Terry, you've been good for us. Go off and do it. And the fact that he played six minutes for the rest of the season after that is just absolutely baffling. He is not good. Um, I, I continue to maintain that he is not good, but if he plays minutes, the stats come, and there is absolutely no denying that. So if for some reason some team decides, you know what, shit, Terrence Jones is now our power forward of the future, they'd be wrong, but if they decide that and play him 30 minutes a night, he's got top 50 upside. There's no debating that whatsoever. It's the ability for him to actually find a role on a roster, a role in a, uh, in a rotation, and 
a role or, and 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 the minutes that it's just not going to happen and that, that's that's sort of where i am with uh, terry jones but you know my dislike of, of jones as an nba player let's look at their lineups they had four lineups over 100 minutes their most used lineup was yanni dally Parker, Snell, and Henson. There's two things wrong with that lineup, and one of them is that Delavadova's in it, and the second one is that John Henson's in it. Unsurprisingly, they were a negative 2.8. Their best lineup of over 100 minutes includes some players, or this is this is a better lineup, and this is what they ran with during the playoffs as their starting lineup. Yanni, Brogdon, Thon McCurr, Chrissy Middleton, and Tone Snell, and that was a whopping plus 7.8. That is the sort of lineup that, that does make more sense for this team and as you'll see as we go through the other best lineups there's one name that uh is, is pretty consistent through those lineups the most used four man yanni dally parker and snell a negative 3.6 unsurprising delavadova was bad the best four man brogdon munro toledovich and terry that bench unit was a massive plus 22 the most used three man yanni dally and snelly minus 2.3 a negative lineup with Delavadova, unsurprising. The best three men, Brogdon, Munro, Terry, plus 15.3. Hmm. The most used two-man lineup, Yanni and Snell. That's a negative 1.1. Again, Snell's not that good. The best two-man, Munro, Mirza, 9.9. Munro is just in all of their best lineups. Apart from that best five-man lineup, which had McCurr in there, and I've got no problem with that, but Greggy Munro was a real key to this team being successful, and the way that he was used and treated was a detriment to him, but it was a detriment to this team as well, in my opinion. Let's now, uh, let's now talk about today's presenting sponsor, and that is, of course, Blue Apron. We welcome Blue Apron back to the show. As a sponsor, they are the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in the entire United States. You should know what Blue Apron is by now, but if you don't, what it is, it's a subscription subscription service. You subscribe, they send you meals, but they don't just send you prepackaged meals. They send you the freshest ingredients, the best ingredients that you can get or that they can source, that they find sustainably sourced from right across the country. Uh, seafood sustainably sourced in the partnership with the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch. You know, beef, chicken, and pork from responsibly raised animals. They send it all in pre-portion sizes, so there's no waste. It's not that you have to go to the supermarket and say, oh, I need to buy lettuce, and you have to buy a whole head of lettuce, and you're going to use four leaves. It, Blue Apron provides you the exact amount. Do you need to use ponzu sauce for your Japanese recipe? Maybe. But do you need to go buy a whole bottle from the Asian grocer? probably not a great idea whereas blue apron they will send you that whole everything you need little quantities portioned out so there's no waste not only does it do that and and help food waste which is a big problem in the world is that the food is is, is beautiful it's absolutely fantastic and it expands your horizons as a cook at home cooking at home provides a sense of i was asked by my son on the weekend dad you know, do you like cooking yeah i like cooking is why do you like cooking so that's a really good question. And this is in amongst the other philosophical discussions he was having with me. Do you like your job? What do you like about it? Okay, let's go back to cooking. Why do you like cooking? So the reason I like cooking is A, you create something that you enjoy and that other people can enjoy. So you can you can go ahead, do it, make it, eat it, and you go, you know what? I made this and it tastes bloody brilliant. Other people can go, you know what, Josh? That's That tastes really good. You have pride in your own work and you get to try new things. And that's one of the other important things with Blue Apron is they provide just a, such a variety of recipes that that the um, you, you get to taste things that you haven't tasted before. Blue Apron can be delivered to 99% of the continental United States and doesn't get much better than that. Shipping that exact amount is also a, a key part. Cooking together builds family strong family bonds and research shows that Blue Apron families cook nearly three times more often together. Let's have a look at some of the meals that are there for Blue Apron this week. Crispy chicken tenders with roasted potatoes and summer squash. That looks pretty good. I like this one. Vietnamese-style vegetable sandwiches with sriracha mayonnaise and roasted gai lan. And my favorite risotto is probably my favorite food of all time. Tomato saffron risotto, or as you guys would say in the States, risotto. Tomato saffron risotto with sauteed summer squash and baby greens salad. You can get yourself three free meals 
from Blue Apron. So check out this week's menu, get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash L-O-F-B. You will love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home cooked meals with Blue Apron. So don't wait. That's blueapron.com slash L-O-F-B. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. All right, let's now get into these uh, into these Bucks players on a more individual basis and start breaking those guys down. We start, of course, with Yanni Adetokounmpo, who was the sixth ranked player this year in eight category leagues. He was uh, he was a star. He averaged 36 minutes a game in his 80 games, 23 points, half a three, nine boards, five and a half assists, 1.7 steals, and 1.9 blocks. Yeah. He was eligible across four positions as well on Yahoo. You get a point guard that's blocking two shots. That's stupid. 52% from the field, 77% from the line. And, and of course, the real detriment there is the 22, oh sorry, 27% from three. He still had a true shooting of 60%, but he could have been so much higher. So where do we where do we go from Yanni? What did he do this year that was you know, so spectacular? Well, he, he took his scoring up six points per 36 minutes. He rebounded an extra rebound a game. He got an extra assist a game. And I actually thought his assist numbers were a little bit disappointing because at the end of last season, he was going at like six, seven assists per game, but only settled into 5.3 this year. So a little bit disappointing that he wasn't able to be as creative and he was playing point guard, not as much as I think what we anticipated, but his ability to increase his steals rate and his block blocks rate by almost 50% on last season, it was massive got his free throw percentage up, got his field goal percentage up, and you saw that true shooting rise to 60%, as well as taking his usage from 22 to 28. This guy is a star. Um, a marginal drop-off from him post-All-Star. Nothing nothing too great, but a marginal drop-off. But I don't think you've got too much to complain about with that to Kumpo. He is a clear top-level draft pick. If you wanted to pick him number one in a draft, I would have absolutely no issue with that because you're getting blocks, assists, you're getting rebounds, scoring, field goal, and free throw percentage. That's a really rare combination. He is in that conversation for those first few players, Harden, Westbrook, Steph, KD, Kawhi, Yanni, Towns, Davis. I'm probably missing someone in that group, but that is that upper echelon group and if you said i'm taking yanni number one i wouldn't argue if you're in a dynasty draft i think it's yanni or towns that goes number one even davis they're your three guys i would think you're taking that uh, number one setting for the uh, dynasty leagues he's ridiculous he's going to continue to get better and he's got scope to get better because he can actually average more assists he could get to six and a half assists he could get 1.1 1.23s and get that to 34 percent which would bump his field goals from 51 to 52 or 53 percent and that is that 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 pushes him into top three consideration pretty clearly. And again, if I was in a draft with you and you took Yanni at number one, I wouldn't say what are you doing. I would say that's that's totally understandable because he had such a big rise this year, and there are still incremental areas to look at that he, he can improve. And that's something I always look at with these players: can they improve? Because he goes, okay, he's young, he's going to improve. But I say, where does he improve? Yes, he can probably score 25 a game, so that's improved, but it's the three-point shooting, it's the assist numbers that can come up as well. He's got the complete package, he does it in every area, and he's just, as his nickname would uh, suggest, he's a freak. The team was only 2.9 points per 100 possessions better off. I think a lot of that's to do with the t time that he shared with Deliver Dover as well. So that's n that's not ideal, but he wasn't a team best. In fact, he was behind numerous players on this team like Munro, like Brogdon, uh, like Middleton, like Terry um, and Toledovic as well. So he was behind all those guys in the on-off numbers. Still a positive, but not as, you know, look at, you know, say, uh, Jim Butler on the Bulls, who was like a plus 11 guys like that like he wasn't as dominant in that area as some of those other guys let's talk chrissy middleton who um obviously had that bad hamstring injury to start the season only played 29 games w was pretty impressive in that time he was the 50th ranked player in 31 minutes and some of that is because he had to ease himself back into it now he he I was going to say he didn't ease himself in as much as I thought he would or as much as I thought Jason Kidd would. Um, he got his minutes back up pretty quickly, but he still wasn't at the level that he was last season. Last season, he played 36 minutes a game. This year, he was at just uh, just those 30 minutes per game, averaging 15 points, 1.6 threes, four boards, three and a half assists, one and a half steals, 45, 88, and 43 is his percentage. So yeah, fairly elite shooting stuff there from Chrissy Middleton. 
um, put together you know, really, really strong numbers. And he's going to be a real interesting one for next year. Now, he led the team in on-off at a plus 7.1. Um, what do we expect? We look at his number comparison from this year to last year. And if we look at it on per 36 basis to see how much he, he dropped off without considering the minutes. His scoring dropped by one and a half points per game. The threes were the same. The rebounding actually went up. The assists were the same. And that was a concern is with Yanni handling the ball more, will his assists drop? Well, they didn't. They stayed the same. His steals were the same. His blocks were the same. And his efficiency was actually, uh, exactly the same. The only thing that changed is he took one less shot per game and that resulted in one and a half less points per game. And he increased his rebounds. So if you think that he gets back to 35 or 36 minutes per game, then he's a top 30 player with potential to rise into the top 20, especially with Jabari Parker likely to miss the first couple of months of the season and then be eased in for probably the, the next couple of months after that or at least the next month after that. So Middleton to me, and I know I had a lot of questions about Chrissy Middleton, I think that he will be back into be that top 30 player, a, a guy that should be out. Now, he averaged 18 points a game last season and also two years ago and just 15 this year. He gets back to that 16, 17 range. One and a half to two threes, four boards, four assists, one and a half steals, solid efficiency. That's a player that is a top 30 guy, in my opinion, and might be a little bit underrated in certain circles. I wouldn't necessarily take him in the top 30, but I think that he will be a top 30 guy with the potential to be a top 20 player, he does have that upside. So I would expect um, yeah, a, a big, big rise on the numbers Middleton did this season when we look at what he does next year. Really excited. I'm, you know, I'm a massive Chris Middleton fan. I'm, I'm really excited to see what he is going to be able to do. Let's look, look at Jabari. He played 51 games before that ACL injury, and he was looking really good. He was, he was um, almost a top 50 player for the year, 52nd for the season. 34 minutes, 20 points a game, 1.3 th threes, which is a, a real improvement for him. Six boards, three assists, another really uh, big area of improvement for Parker. A steal, half a block, 49, 74, and 37% for a true shooting of 56. Now, um, I guess somewhat troublingly, he was the team worst in on-off at negative 5.4. And he does still have his defensive struggles. And his head-to-head -head rank was a little bit lower than his um, than his rotisserie rank there. So 75th versus 53rd. So a little bit of a drop-off there. But I think you still should be impressed with what Parker did. I, I know I was. He took his scoring rate up significantly. He hit, in his first two seasons combined, he hit 13 three-pointers. He hit 65 this year. That is a huge change. And that was something we were always calling out for. Can he hit threes? And he hit in his first year, 25%. In his second year, 26%. This season, 37%. It really became a threat there. Took his assist rate up from two in his rookie year, 1.9 in his second year, up to three. That's a 100% that's a, um, increase on his assist rate. His steals stayed you know, consistent, that one steal a game. He was quite high with that in his rookie year. Hasn't been able to replicate that. He's never going to be a shot blocker, but what he's going to be is a 20-point scorer who can now hit a three a game and get you six boards and get you that surprising three assists per game with a steal and do it efficiently. And that's a player who should become a top 50 guy if he wasn't coming off a second ACL to the same knee. And that is a real concern with Parker, obviously. He responded from that first ACL with a really huge athleticism, um, you know, bounding in for dunks and, and just looked like he hadn't heard it. Does that happen after two? That's the real concern. He's still young. But the concern is that after two ACLs and that same knee, that uh, his explosion won't be the same level, and that that could really impact him. He was his trajectory was pushing to become a top forty player. I think that in terms of his stats, though, when you look at those numbers, you know, twenty and six and three, you know, where where does the improvement come? Does he start averaging nine boards a game? I don't think so. Eight? I don't think so. Does he get to twenty two points a game? Probably not with Yanni and Middleton there. I, I think that twenty to twenty one is maybe about right. Steals and blocks, they'll never really get too much bigger. And does his efficiency go from forty nine? Can he bump it to fifty two? I would say probably not there as well. So maybe the area he can improve is his free throw percentage, where he was at seventy four percent. But he doesn't have massive, massive scope for improvement. 
And with that ACL, it does put a dampener on what he can do. I do expect him to miss the first couple of months of the season. Maybe he returns around Christmas would be my early guess. And then he plays at a limited level for the first month or so. And you might get full pace Jabari post All-Star. So that's going to make drafting him in standard leagues quite tough. If you're requiring him in dynasty leagues, you've got to take a few things into consideration. The fact that he won't play this season or won't be he won't be ready to start the season more, more accurately. And will he ever be able to main or get that explosion back and be able to finish at the level that he was, which is 49%, and score at that level? There is a real chance that that dips and maybe he doesn't average 20 points a game ever again. I think that he can, but there is a real chance that he isn't able to do that just because of this second ACL. So if you're acquiring him in Dynasty, I wouldn't be paying the money that it requires to get or paying the value that it requires to get a top 50 guy because my certainty of him doing that is fairly limited just with this return from the ACL. But if you can get it at a bonus, knowing that it's it's pretty much a write-off season, uh, I'd be okay in uh, I'd be okay in doing that with Jabari Parker, Greggy Munro finished the season as the 92nd ranked player in only 22 and a half minutes. He played 81 games and averaged 11.7 points, 6.6 boards, 2.3 assists, 1.1 steals, half a block. 53 and 74 for a true shooting of 57%. Um, hated the way that he was used this year. He went from 29 minutes a game down to 23 minutes a game. Still a top 100 player in those limited minutes. Still, as, as I touched on, you're really positive in all those lineups. He was second on the team with a positive 6.9 in his on-off numbers. The thing here with Munro is that if he remains in Milwaukee, I think that this is his role moving forward. The fact that they continually played Miles Plumley and John Henson ahead of him was the, the number one reason why Kid should have been fired for, for me this season. You, you can tell me that he's a bad defender, and I know that's, oh, you can't defend. Cool. Neither can John Henson. Right? Neither can Miles Plumley. Munro was very, very good as a defender this season, I thought, and people who watch the Bucks closely, I'm sure you would agree with that, that he was a good defender this year. He wasn't a great defender. He's not an elite defender, but he was a good defender. He hustled a lot. He provides a lot offensively, and his passing and his ability to get steals is also something that helps him defensively. The fact that those absolute knobs in Henson and Plumley, maybe they're not knobs, I don't know them personally, basketball knobs were playing 20 minutes ahead of him was ludicrous. The decisions of Kidd to play three centers in a game and then come out and say, we're only going to play two centers in a game and then play three centers in a game for the next five games was infuriating. It made no sense. Henson never worked. We knew it never worked. He tried it eight times. It never worked, but he kept going back to it because he is dumb and stubborn. The thing is now, is that Thon McCurr's there? And I loved what I saw from McCurr. He is the future for this team. And a 24-24 split for him and Munro next season seems probably the most likely outcome. And maybe even 25 McCurr, 18 Munro. And we've got to have, of course, we've got to slide John Henson in there as well. So the concern with Munro is that if he stays in Milwaukee, that it's, uh, it's all become, going to become McCurr. Now, or it's going to become majority McCurr as we push forward. And, and that, that is the concern. He gets 26 minutes a game, Munro. He's a top 100 player. There's no there's no denying that. So I guess it depends on, on where he ends up if he's back in Milwaukee. But if he's in a situation in Milwaukee, I think that getting 22 minutes a night, which again was too low what he got this season, I don't actually think he'll get to that next season. And I, I wouldn't have a problem with that because using McCurr ahead of him is totally fine with me. Using Henson and Plumley, not so much. So as much as I criticize Kidd for playing in 22 minutes a game, I can see him playing less next year and me being okay with it. But he doesn't need much playing time to become a useful fantasy player, and this season for that was pretty much case in point. He was he was really good for this team. He was a key portion of their success. He had a PER of 21, so an absolutely massive PER for, for a player that, again, was just used incredibly poorly throughout the season by Kidd and, uh, and his coaching staff. Another player who did have his struggles during the year, Malcolm Brogdon, and by struggles, I mean the fact that he was underused. He was a guy that as soon as Chrissy Middleton went down, I said, this is the guy that you want. This is the guy that uh, this is the guy that I think should be playing alongside Dalla playing that shooting guard role. That's not the way they went. They transitioned him completely into a point guard, which is not something that I necessarily 100% saw coming out of college. Although at Summer League, he played exclusively point guard, so we could see that transition happening. But he played... 
at that point guard position. I would have loved to have seen him getting minutes instead of Rashad Vaughn, who remains absolutely terrible, and over Tone Snell, but getting them over Dalla Vadova was totally fine, but it still took ages for him to actually be pushed into a decent size role when he was clearly the best option there. Clearly. He was the team was 4.8 points per hundred possessions better off with him on the court. Dally was a negative 3.4. We saw all those lineups. The most used ones had Dally in them. They were all negatives, and Brogdon was all in the positive ones. He played 26 minutes a game, 10 points, three boards, four assists, a three, a steal, and shot 46, 87, and 41. That 41% from three for a rookie is fantastic. And post All Star, it was even better. He was the 73rd ranked player uh, post All Star, 91st head to head post All Star. Averaging 29 minutes a game, 12.5 points, 1.33s, three boards, 4.5 assists, and a steal on 50, 91, and 39 for a true shooting of 60%, which as a rookie is ludicrous. And you can throw out, oh yes, but he was an older rookie as much as you want. Chris Dunn was also an older rookie, and he was terrible. That's why that NBA ready tag is such a load of shit to me, because it's all automatically slapped on players who have been in college three to four years, when the likelihood of a freshman being NBA ready is probably the same level as what a senior is. Some guys just are, some guys just aren't, and it's not always a factor of age, because you can pick out plenty of seniors who weren't NBA ready, but he healed for the start of the season. Chris Dunn, hor horrendous. Or freshmen who actually who actually were able, Carl Anthony Towns, he was NBA ready. Who knew? Anthony Davis, also NBA ready. Damian Lillard, NBA ready. Jim Fredette, not NBA ready. That that's uh, that's again just another part of things that are, that do frustrate me. But uh, Brogo was was good. Uh, you would have to assume that he goes into next season as the starting point guard. If the coach was anyone other than Jason Kidd, you would assume that. I still assume it, but I, I have my level of doubt just on what, what sort of dumbness Kidd is going to provide. But I think that he's a 30-minute-a-game player and you know, should be a guy with limited upside, but solid numbers in that 70 to 100 range. I probably wouldn't start picking him to about the 90 zone, especially um, with, um, I was going to say with Parker coming back, but he's not coming back initially. I think he's, he's a guy that I would take in the top 100, but I probably wouldn't jump into the top 75 for him. He's in that back end range. And I know someone asked a question about him later on. He is who he is. He's steady as it goes, really steady production, but can he get better than this? Like, where does he get better? Will he be more efficient? Oh, shit, no. He's not shooting 50 and 91, which is what he did post-All-Star. Like, he can't get better than that. Will his steal numbers improve? That's a possibility. Maybe up to one and a half steals. I could see that going. Four and a half assists. Well, with Parker, Middleton, and Yanni all handling the ball, he's never going to be a six and a half assist game guy. I could see him being a five a game guy and being a 13 point player with one and a half threes and, and maybe four rebounds, which pushes him, you know, but close to that top 60, top 70 range, but I feel more comfortable in the 80s to 90s at this point with Brogdon. His, his room for growth, I think, is limited, um, and there's value in just having consistently good play, but his, his room for growth, I, I think, is a little... He, he will get better, but he won't get, he won't get markedly better throughout the next few seasons. But I was super impressed with him, and that gives me a good segue to talk about tomorrow's show, um, which I'll be doing an NBA draft preview show with Sam Vecini of the Sporting News, and Sam was the one who first turned all uh, all Locked On Fantasy listeners onto Malcolm Brogdon when we had this discussion last season. He was super high on him, and, and the fact that Sam was just so adamant about Brogdon being a, a guy that, that should be a first-round pick and being a guy that's uh, going to surprise a lot of people made me pay extra attention to him when I saw him in Summer League and then therefore made me be pay extra attention to telling you that this is going to be the guy who has an impact for this team. And that ended up working out all right. So hopefully Sam's got another player like Brogo that he can recommend to us tomorrow when we do the show. So make sure you are listening to that and staying tuned, of course. Let's talk my man, Johnny Henson, who, much like Terrence Jones, who I referenced earlier, is a player that can put up fantasy stats when he plays. 58 games played, 19 and a half minutes, 7 points, 5 boards, half a steal, 1 and a half blocks, 51 and 69 with a 55 true shooting. Giggity! Um, John Henson obviously is a shot blocker. That is where his value comes from. But he saw his, he's seen his rate, or he saw his rate drop dramatically. The last two years, he'd been at over four blocks per 36 minutes. This year, at 2.6. That's a big, big difference. The team was worse off with him on the court. Anybody could have told you that. He's not a scoring threat. He had this weird stretch where he started trying to attempt jumpers. Doesn't work, because he's not good at them. Um, I just, He's just not good. 
It's as, as simple as that. McCurr, Munro, if he returns, that is your center rotation, and Henson should be the third stringer. But with Kidd, he's just as likely to go out there and play Henson over Munro, play Henson over McCurr, and, and, and do dumb stuff. I think that it's pretty much over for Henson in Milwaukee. My dislike of Kidd, it's, it's not fading, but I am having more confidence in him making the right decisions. And he generally does make the right decisions. It just takes 50 games for him to get there. And stuff that appears pretty straightforward after five games or 10 games, it takes him 50 games to work out that decision. And that decision is to start Brogdon, to move Henson from the rotation, to, to get Munro some more minutes in, that sort of stuff. It takes him a long time to figure that stuff out. I think he's figured it out with Henson, although I probably said that 10 times before, and then next minute, Henson's starting and playing 25 minutes, and Munro's a DMP CD, and you go, what is this knob doing? And that's uh, the joys of dealing with Jason Kidd from a fantasy point of view. Um, he is, yeah, I, I just don't think he's good. Uh, it's as simple as that. Now, if the block rate comes back up, then he can have use in fantasy, but if he's not blocking four shots per 36, then he's having no use to us as a fantasy option. He did block one and a half shots per game this season, which is a, a positive number, but he was you know, such a big negative in so many other areas that you could only use him as a block specialist. And as I say, I think he's a third stringer now, and that's going to really limit what he can do unless Munro is gone, but I'd hate to have a mccurr henson combination as my as my center combo. I just don't think that there's anywhere near enough offense in that zone, and I would rather play out Kumpo at center than have Henson in there for, for big chunks of time. I'm just not... Um, just not a... Just not a, not a great... Um, just not, not not a big fan of him, as, again, you're all probably well aware he's that player who's more at 16, maybe 18, shit, maybe even 20-team league guy from now on. Tone Snell, big season from Tone, 80 games, 29 minutes a game, started pretty much all the year, 8.5 points, 1.8 threes, 3 rebounds, 1.2 assists, 0.7 steals, shot 45 and 81 and 41 from 3 for a true shooting of 60, which for a guard is absolutely phenomenal, especially considering his true shooting last year was 48. He shot 36% from 3 and 37% from the field last season. Um, was able to take those up you know, significantly this year. But he is not a good fantasy player. He played 29 minutes a game. He was probably the worst starting caliber player from a fantasy point of view, or starting player that played starters minutes from a fantasy point of view. The 100, and, uh, where was he ranked? The 178th ranked player for the season. Uh, he was 217th pre All Star, 167th post All Star. He just hits threes and he did he did that in bunches he had a few games where he was able to knock in you know, plenty of threes a five game um a five three-pointer game here another five point five three-pointer game there a six three-pointer back in uh, december on boxing day where he had 20 points just these weird out of the box performances when tone snell gets hot but otherwise he, he just doesn't bring enough he doesn't get for a three and d guy he doesn't get steals he doesn't rebound. Shit, he can't pass. He can't dribble. He doesn't score in any other way. He is a three-point specialist. And with Middleton returning and then Parker eventually returning, Snell's role will reduce in the second half of the season if he actually returns to Milwaukee. Now, if any other team ponies up big money for him, uh, which I think someone will offer him a $10 million deal, which is just unbelievable to me that Tone Snell could, could be that. They will be very disappointed, and you'll be disappointed if you chase after him for fantasy stats. Think of Alan Crabb. He's a worse version of Alan Crabb, and you don't like Alan Crabb. He's a guy that hits threes. Tone Snell was actually a negative defensively with his defensive box score plus minus at negative 1.1. He had a PR of just 9.7, and that's despite the fact that he shot 60% true shooting, which is massive. He had a negative box score plus minus as well, and as I mentioned, he was a negative 5.1 just behind Jabari Parker in the on-off numbers for worst on this team. So while his hustle looks good, his defense looks good, the hot three-point shooting looks good, the overall true shooting is good. The overall package of Tone Snell, I still don't think he's that good. And he is destined to me to be a sixth man, um, maybe a seventh man on this team once everyone is healthy, if they bring him back. So you do have to you know, factor that into consideration. And I would assume that while he might get 29 minutes for the first three months of the season, he will probably be getting 25 or so in the second half of the season. So even in your deeper leagues, you need to be looking at head-to-head -head playoffs. I expect Tone Snell's minutes. If he returns to Milwaukee to be on the decline and to go from being that 170-ranked player to maybe the maybe the 220th-ranked player. And then that's where I'd see him settling in 
not being able to be a starter unless some team again decides to over maybe maybe the Knicks overpay for him that'd be funny um who knows someone could overpay and decide for him to be a starter and he will struggle and he would never be a good fantasy player and I'm pretty confident in saying that although I was pretty confident in saying he would never be a decent NBA player but he was able to flourish to a degree but I think the level of flourish and the level of success that he had in Milwaukee has been somewhat overstated um he fit perfectly what they needed to do but I don't think that he was good all the time. He was definitely not great. Um, he was good at times, but not all the time. And there is a, a significant distinction to be made with that. Mick Beasley played 56 games for this team, 16.7 points. He had a, uh, an MCL sprain, was able to return from that at the end of the year. Nine and a half points, three and a half boards, half a steal, half a block, and super efficient going 53 and 74, including 42% from three and was a 59 true shooting for the season. He came over in that trade for Tyler Ennis. A lot of people, for some reason, were thinking that when Middleton went down, Beasley would replace him. That made no sense. He is strictly a four. Um, he got an opportunity to replace Jabari Parker when Parker went down. He did it okay, but he still never got the big minutes. But after that all-star break period with no Parker, he was the 177th ranked player. Beasley, he only played nine games, but averaged 10 and three with 0.7 steals and 0.6 blocks and did it efficiently. He is a points streamer, which can be hard to find, and he can do that efficiently. And those defensive numbers are more impressive than what you'd expect. And he did all that post-All-Star in just 16 minutes a game. So there is scope for him to get better, especially with Parker missing for the start of the year. But I do imagine that they'll just run that same starting lineup back and play Adetokounmpo at power forward, Middleton at the three, Snell, Brogo, and McCurr as that starting five, assuming that uh, assuming that Snell does return. That's how I do see them running that. So I don't see massive upside for Beasley. Maybe he's an 18-minute game a guy, but... Uh, 18 minute a game guy but just another example of kids frustration that he would play Beasley you know three games and then take him out of the rotation and play Toledovic for four games and then put Beasley back in for three games and never able to settle on what he was doing in that role and that did impact any reliability that you could have for Michael Beasley the team was 2.7 points worse off with him on the court and that's not terrible it's also obviously not great but it's not as bad as Henson, it's not as bad as Della Vadova, it's not as bad as Snell, it's not as bad as Parker, um, and it's not as bad as, of course, as my boy Rashad Vaughn. Let's look at Jason Terry. Unbelievable to me that Jason Terry was... Uh, actually, no, let's not. Let's go to Della Vadova. We'll go to Dally first, sorry. 76 games for Della Vadova, 26 minutes a game. A putrid 7.6 points, 2 rebounds, and 4.7 assists. That's a good number. 0.7 steals, but shot 39 from the field, 85 from the line, and 36% from three for a true shooting of 50. He came across after having shot 40% in Cleveland, and a lot of the criticism was, yeah, that, that's fine, but anyone can shoot 40% when they play alongside LeBron James. And of course, that statement's not true. Um, but Del Vadova did drop off in his three-point percentage, but it didn't crater. He went to 36%, putting him above average, not elite like 40, but it, it did push him back a little bit. But his inability to finish at the rim absolutely crucified his season. He wasn't able to score, but those assists were very tasty. But I think we can all agree that Malcolm Brogdon is the better player, and he's the team's starting point guard as we move forward. Daly was a team, was a, not team worst, he was a minus 3.4 in the on-off numbers. He was that guy that's probably a 20-team league just based on overall value, but his ability to get those assists, those four assists or so in that backup role, it pushed him to be a 14-team leaguer, but I don't think he gets 26 minutes a game next season. I think that pushes down to maybe 20, 21 minutes a game, and that pushes his assist down from the 4.7 down to maybe 3.8. 3.9, um, and he's just not giving you much else in any other area. So that's going to limit him to to really those 20 team sort of formats back to where his overall value is. And even then, uh, that might be a stretch given the fact that he's just such a negative in many other areas. I like what he does do defensively, but uh, from a fantasy point of view, his numbers just were, weren't great. Although he did struggle a lot defensively this year. Bad defensive box score, plus minus, you know, bad PR, bad true shooting. It was just a bad season for a guy. The fact that the Bucks played their th three highest minutes players were Adetokounmpo, Snell, and Della Vadova, and two of those guys had a PER under 10. It's actually pretty amazing that they made the playoffs, and that's why I do give kudos to Jason Kidd. He still underplayed guys like Brogdon and Munro and, and, and even Toledovic to a degree, the guys that, that could have helped them. He did underplay those players, so that, again, that's where the criticism lies, but he still was able to do 
um, you know, great things with the limitations that were brought on him externally by the injuries and internally by his whatever coaching decisions that he made, which would be a restriction to any team. Spencer Hawes, he played too many games in Milwaukee, 19 of them, nine minutes a game, four and a half points, two and a half rebounds. He hit half a three. He was 51% from the field, 78 from the line, and 35 from three. That 51% from Hawes was in large part helped by the fact that he went 93% at the rim, numbers that won't be able to be uh, continued. He is not that efficient a player. I don't know whether he takes a $6 million player option. I, th I think it's probably up in the air. I think he, if if I had to guess, he would opt out and look for maybe a three-year, $15 million a year deal. Sorry, $15 million total deal, $5 million a year a little bit more long-term security, but he is going to be behind uh, McCurr in the rotation and Henson, um, but, and it depends on Munro. There's very little hope for Spencer having any sort of impact. He was, in his time in Milwaukee, the 338th ranked player. I wouldn't be getting too excited there. He was a negative 12.5 in those, in those uh, 19 games that he played for them as well. If he plays 30 minutes, he does actually have a decent fantasy skill set, but any team playing Spencer Hawes 30 minutes a game at this point in the in his career, eh, they're going to be in a lot, a lot of trouble. Jason Terry, let's get back to him. 74 games for Terry, 18 minutes a game. And it's l absolutely remarkable to me that Terry was on a team this year and playing consistent minutes. And I, I had criticisms of him playing those minutes, and I think rightly so, because he shouldn't have been in uh, plenty of the time that he was. But... The lineups with Terry were really successful, and a lot of that was fueled by Munro and Brogdon, but he was a plus 6.8 on-off himself, which was obviously a really super, and he did a lot of winning things, but he was playing clutch time over guys like Chris Middleton, and that sort of stuff never made sense to me. Again, back to the criticisms that I have of Jason Kitts. Some of his decision-making is just absolutely horrendous, and that was part of it, but Terry was a positive. He only averaged four points a game. He averaged a three a game, 0.6 um, 0.6 triples, sorry, 0.6 steals, 43% from the from the field and 83% from the line, including 42% from three. But he's not going to be a fantasy threat for every everyone or for anyone. He's more a any league over 20 team leagues you could look at him. But at the age that Jason Terry is, and he's going to be 40 next season, is he is he back on this team at all? He's an unrestricted free agent. I'm not 100% sure that he is, and I think that having any sort of faith in Terry, yeah. Even repeating what he did from an on-off plus-minus point of view next season is going to be going to be tough. And if he if he retires, I wouldn't be shocked. The mitten, Gary Payton the second, six games at seventeen minutes, three points, two rebounds, two assists, half a steal, 0.7 blocks. Now, I talk about he shot eleven percent on threes, horrendous. Thirty-six from the field, horrendous. Sixty percent from the line, horrendous. A true shooting of forty-one, as you know, horrendous. But I like Payton. I think there is something there to see with him development-wise, and I think that they should look to retain him and work on him as a third point guard. He is a player that does translate pretty well into fantasy. Good shot blocker, good rebounder, gets those assists. Like in, in 16 minutes a game, he only scored three points, but he had two boards, he had two and a half or 2.2 .2 assists, half a steal, 0.7 blocks. Like they are impressive numbers. It is in limited minutes. It's in like 100 minutes. It is very limited. But there is enough there if you're in a 30-team league that you say, I think Peyton can catch on with a team. And I think that in three years' time, he could be an 18-minute-a-game player, a 20-minute-a-game backup, and be useful and maybe even sniff the top 200 for maybe one season. I think that there is something there with Peyton. I'm not fully convinced of it. I'm not 100% confident, but he is a guy just to keep an eye on. A player whose value really created this season was Mirza Toledovic. Now, he was awesome for the Suns in the second half of the year before, um, ended up as the 163rd ranked player all of last season and was much higher than that post-All-Star. But he saw his playing time really drop, and Jason Kidd, uh, I think, um, mishandled him this season. He went from 21 minutes down to 16 minutes, scored just six points as his field goal percentage dropped from 43 to 37%, and his three-pointer percentage dropped from 39 to 34 and that caused a true shooting drop from 57 to 51. He also saw his usage rate drop, which was always going to be a concern when he was really the, the focal point in Phoenix, uh, heading to Milwaukee. That wasn't the case. And he provides really very little else apart from three-pointers and, uh, and scoring. 
I don't know what the future holds for him if Beasley doesn't return. There is some, uh, there are some minutes there for him at the four, but he's going to be just that deeper league guy that I think is going to struggle to push into the top 250 with the way that, uh, with the way that Kidd uses him, and that's a real shame. The teams were, the team was good with him on the court, 5.2 on off, which is obviously really positive. And I thought he probably could have been used a little bit more and was used frustratingly, wasn't able to get into a rhythm. But from a fantasy point of view, I, I don't really see massive upside for him. He was He's never going to be a top 100 player ever, I don't think. And top 150, you know, maybe, but it needs to be really in a situation that's geared around him. And it's only going to be a, a, a situation where you know, three guys get injured during the season and he has to assume a man, the bigger mantle on a team that's uh, sucking and not in the playoffs. And that's a, a lot of things that need to happen for that to be the case. And I don't see him being that player in Milwaukee. So he's not a player to acquire. I don't think he's bouncing back to Phoenix or Brooklyn days based on the, the situation or, or where he currently is on this team. And he's 31 years of age. I don't really see much hope for uh, Mr. Toledovic moving forward. Let's talk Thon McCurr. 57 games for McCurr, 9.9 minutes per game. That's his season-long numbers. But after the All-Star break is where it gets a little bit more exciting. 13 minutes, 4.5 points, 2.5 rebounds, 0.6 blocks, 43 and 71 with half a three. And those numbers shouldn't get you too excited. He was the 313th ranked player after the All-Star break. But... We saw in the playoffs, as he pushed to 20 minutes a game, 24 minutes a game, he looks like he is going to be a player. And I think that he gets, from the get-go next season, 20 minutes a game at least, and probably is at 24 to 25 minutes a game. He's a guy that can score. He is a very, very high-energy rebounder. He can block shots, and he can hit threes, and he can do it efficiently. I think that he has got tremendous upside from a fantasy point of view, probably top 100 upside. I think that he'll probably have a top 100 ups, uh, 100 season in his career, and it probably won't be next year. I don't think that'll be the case, but I would have no issue with taking him with my last pick in a standard draft, pick 150 around that mark, and seeing where it pans out. Because... Yeah, what he was able to do in those playoffs and as he improved throughout the season, and more importantly, as Kidd gained more confidence in him. Now, when he kept starting him at the end, at that post-All-Star period, he'd start him, he'd play him five minutes, and he wouldn't play him again. And I couldn't be more critical of that. It just makes absolutely no sense to me. And you go, oh, he's getting the experience of starting. Yeah, what's the point if he sits on his ass for the next 43 minutes of the game? But after that, he, he played more. They would bring him back in after that first stint. They would start him the second half. All stuff that really started to translate into him playing better. And I thought even from you know, really early on in the season, as soon as he was on the court, he looked okay. And his defense really improved. I think he's going to be a player that averages two blocks a game at some point and over a three and maybe scores 14 with eight boards. I think that is, that is probably Thon's upside. And I'm really excited to see it develop. He is, you know, getting him in Dynasty might be tough at this point, but I can see some significant upside for McCurr here, and I think he enters next season as the starting center, and instead of playing 12 minutes a game, which he did post-All-Star, he's 22, he's 23, around that around that sort of a mark, and that's only going to go up if uh, if Munro isn't there. So I think there's big things in store for, uh, for McCurr for next season. And I think we should be uh, pretty excited to see his future. I think he's got a yeah, definite, I said top 100. I think he's probably got top 70, maybe even top 50 upside at this point. Really huge room for him to develop and for him to grow. And we saw some uh, signs and some steady progression, which is always always what you want to look at when uh, when talking about these players. The last guy is trash, and that's Rashad Vaughn. He is bad. He's one of the worst players in the NBA. He is a team worst, negative 8.1 for on-off numbers. He's a shooter who can't shoot, 32% from three, 37 from the field. He averaged three and a half points in 11 minutes a game. Kid would just randomly decide he's just going to play him. Oh, he's 25 minutes for Rashad Vaughn. Cool. It never made sense. He is bad. He is not getting better. He can't pass. He can't rebound. He doesn't get steals. He can't hit threes. He can't score. He can't shoot. He was 40% free throw shooter. He is bad. He is a player that I'd be even tempted to decline his rookie option. I don't think you, I don't think you should just because you know, having someone on that cheaper contract. But he is bad. He should not be in a rotation. I have zero hope for him. I had zero hope for Tone Snell, so that can always change. But I have zero hope for Vaughn. He has yet to show me one positive thing that he can do in the NBA. And I don't think his NBA career lasts very much longer. Um, he probably plays next season. Maybe he gets that fourth year. I'm, I'm not convinced. He is just really bad. 
The positive thing I will say about him is it's going to be his third season, so a lot of growth can happen there. But shit, he needs to grow a hell of a lot to be uh, to be even a useful tenth man in the NBA. He is nowhere near that at this point, and he has got a lot of work to do. He is just bad in pretty much every area, and I don't think I could be more clear about that. Let's move on to the questions before we wrap this up. Eric Wolfmeyer, great name, Eric. Do you think Becky Hammond would leave the Spurs bench to become the GM in Milwaukee? I think she would be great. I think she would be a great hire, but from everything I've read the last two years, Becky is likely to become Pop's successor. Now, Eric, I'll start off this. What what makes you think that she would be a great hire? I'm not saying that she wouldn't, but what makes you think that she would be? I have a real um, concern with, not with Becky, but with people becoming GMs that have no GM background. And so in all the talk, like Chauncey Billups is going to be in discussion to be the Atlanta GM. Really? Because he was a player? How does that make you a guy able to negotiate contracts um, to be able to scout players? To be able to you know, get the most and understand the CBA? Vladi Divac, that's worked real well. Now it happens, it, it can work occasionally. Steve Kerr was a pretty good GM, but it doesn't always work. And it's got nothing to do with Becky Hammond being a female. I think that she's going to be a head coach at some point. So I don't think that from the Bucks point of view, getting someone to be an uh, to be a GM who's not re- or not really had really much any training in that area to be that GM is necessarily the right move. They've already got uh, Justin can't remember his surname from uh, Golden State there as their assistant GM. They should be promoting him. And let's be honest, Kid's pulling the majority of the strings there, and that's why John Hammond is out because Kid wants that power. So. I think that Hammond will be looking for a head coaching job, and I think that she will get one at some point, and maybe she will become that uh, successor to Pop. A guy like uh, Tori Messina could also be in that sort of a, a, a zone to become that replacement, but I, I don't necessarily think that she'd be a great GM hire just because where's her front office experience? You know, coaching and playing is a very different thing to being a GM, so I'm not sure that she would be a great hire from that perspective. KL Allen, with Chris Middleton going to be fully healthy and once Parker is back, will Yanni's amazing run suffer much in all cats? No, I don't think so. I I, I don't think that that's going to... Yanni is, the, is this team. So if anything, those guys suffer. But uh, given the fact that you're playing with a guy like McCurr, who's low usage, Brogdon can be low usage, Tone Snell is really low usage, Delaver Dover is low usage... Parker, Middleton, Yanni can handle most things offensively, so I don't really have too much concern there. He says we only only specifically fall in scoring boards and assists. I don't think that I don't I don't think much changes with him. To be honest, I, I really I really don't. Um, I think he's just going to be able to power through all that stuff. Eric Lapointe, which Chris Middleton should we expect? Has his role changed in his absence? Have his skills diminished? No, no, no. Does Kid know what to do with him? Um, that's, that's a good question. I, I, no, I think Kid's pretty okay with Middleton. I'm, 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 as I said earlier, I'm, uh, I'm ready to get back on board with Chris Middleton. Chrissy Somerville, should Dally accept the backup, backup point guard job as he's more value off the bench? He has no choice. He is the backup point guard. And will Thon hit the weights or stay lean? He, Thon has the, doesn't have the body to become um, you know, massive. He's never going to... You know, ready for the AFL reference. And if you don't know who this is, look him up. He's never going to be Majak Dor. Um, go, on, uh, go on Google Majak Dor, who's, um, I believe he's Sudanese as well, much like McCurr, but he's uh, got a, a fairly fairly decent body on him. I don't think McCurr is ever going to be that sort of guy. He's never going to have that sort of a body, but he will get stronger, no doubt about that, especially through his core and his legs. And that's really helpful for rebounding. Um, he will definitely hit the weights, no doubt, but he's never going to become massive and jacked. Jackie Dalich, will Snell continue to be the team's best player? Jackie, come on, man. Will he continue to be the team's best player? I know you're trolling at this point. Jordan, do people really fear deer? I don't know. I've never encountered a deer. I would guess that if you're driving along a a lonely highway one night and a deer steps in front of the car, I reckon you'd shit yourself. But I've never had that experience, so I'd guess so. Kyle Norb, how does the front office change affect their future? The change is that Hammond is gone. Kidd has always been angling for this to get rid of Hammond. This has been on the cards. That's why they brought Justin, I'm going to say Vrelink. I think that's his name. I could be wrong. That's why they brought him in is to oust Hammond and Kidd to have this power. So I don't think it changes much. Is it safe to assume Middleton bounces back? Yes, I believe so. Brogdon, is this about as good as it gets? Marginal increase, but but yes. And Parker, how much does the second ACL limit his future? Yeah, it, it's it's a, it's a real concern. There's there's no doubt about that. And that explosion and the scoring ability and the finishing is going to suffer. I think, and there is that real concern there. Sean slash Sean, 
Interesting. What is your ideal scenario for the Bucks center situation? I'd love for Munro to get 30 minutes, but that's not going to happen. I think ideally you're going to get 25 or 24 out of Thon and 24 out of Munro. I think that's probably going to be the best scenario for this team, especially for their future development as well. And James C says, McCurr, how valuable is he for Dynasty? I think he's pretty valuable. As I said, there's a top 50 potential guy in there and almost a guaranteed top 100 guy at some point in his career is the way I feel about McCurr at this point. All right, we're done for today's show. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and Google Play. And of course, tune in for tomorrow's show where we preview the 2017 NBA draft with Sam Vecini from the Sporting News. We'll be covering numerous players. They'll be doing another NBA draft preview show next week as well to get a second opinion from someone else who shall remain nameless at this point, and we'll do that next week to cover the NBA draft. So make sure you are listening to that podcast. We are done here, guys. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya. Yanni. Antes do compor.